Hey everybody, welcome back. We're taking a look at module two of our web literacy work. In this module, we're looking at participation or as we've been framing it, online collaborative inquiry. If we look at online collaborative inquiry, what we're examining is a group of local or global learners who reach a common outcome while co-constructing multiple pathways of knowledge. That's a mouthful. Uh, let's unpack it a little bit. So once again, as we've talked about in the past, we live in incredible times where uh, educators need to figure out on a personal level uh, what do these new technologies, these digital texts and tools offer us. But then at the same time, we often have to think about what do I do with the, the, the people that I educate with my learners, with students in my classroom. Um, and that can be problematic as we try to figure out what do I do in my professional career and in my personal life when we really don't know what the future is going to look like. So if we think about participation online, if we think about this online collaborative inquiry, one of the ways that I begin is I start to think about, okay, well, what is the future of work? How am I preparing my learners for their futures? And we're thinking about work in terms of not just the product and the activity, but also the process of work. You know, showing up every day, making sense of what you have to do and sort of like punching the clock. Part of the challenge is that when we think about work, we often think about, you know, this, this mindset of, okay, I have to show up to work. I have to go to a specific location to work. Um, and many times we think, okay, well, you know, my learners, the, the, the young adults that I deal with, they're going to have to go through the same sort of, you know, work in their future. But the, the challenge in all of that is that may not be true. If we think about the future of work, there is the possibility that many of us currently video conference into different locations, but then at the same time, we think about, you know, what will work be like in the future for our, our students, for our children. And for the most part, they might be, and they probably will video conference in, they will remotely connect in. If you think about this video that we're putting together right now, I'm sitting at my desk. I am sitting in front of multiple monitors. I have a microphone set up. I have various devices around me, and I'm using these tools as a way to connect with you. And you might be consuming this video on a variety of devices. You might be watching on a tablet or watching on a cell phone. You might be reviewing at your computer while you're doing other things. You might be watching on a big screen TV. Um, and you may, depending on how the future advances, and we know it's going to advance pretty quickly, you might be watching this on a variety of different devices that we, don't, we haven't even seen yet. So one of the things we have to think about is that work has changed and it will continue to change. Another thing that we have to think about when we consider participation in online collaborative inquiry is that we're building up and we're trying to scaffold our students so that they can connect and collaborate with others. Um, a part of participation online is that we are reaching out to others online, people that we may never meet face to face, and we are uh, interacting with them. We are collaborating. We are co-constructing information, possibly. Um, if we think about collaboration, we also have to think about back in thinking about work. Many times in collaboration, we want our students to, uh, you know, in the workforce, we want people to collaborate and interact with others. But then when we had them collaborate in school, in educational contexts, a lot of times we think about collaboration and it's viewed as cheating. So we look at students that collaborate on projects or we look at uh, Google Docs and we have them connect with others. Many times we say, okay, well, you know, maybe they are cheating because they're not all putting in the same amount of work. And how do you assess that? How do you make sense of that in your classroom? So that's a challenge as well. When we talk about participating online and we talk about online collaborative inquiry, one of the other things that we have to consider is that there are enormous privacy and security risks that may happen as inter as we interact online. Um, you know, on one level, we have to think about our own interaction and our own participation online and what are the privacy and security challenges as we reach out and we connect and we interact and learn with others online. Uh, what are the privacy and security risks that happen as we interact and we learn openly online and as we share our materials openly online? 
Uh, we also have to think about, okay, well, what happens with our students as they get out and they interact and they sort of, you know, engage with others and they may use Twitter or research or reading materials online, what might happen to them? Um, you know, what challenges might be out there in terms of privacy and security that we need to be considerate of? And we can't just say, I don't think that we can just say, well, there might be some bad things that happen, so we won't, you know, engage and participate and collaborate with others online. I think we have to figure out, okay, how can we do this safely and protect ourselves? One of the last things that I really think about when I consider the aspects of participation online and, and online collaborative inquiry is how this impacts our digital identity. So as we're out there and we're interacting and connecting with others, we are through our digital breadcrumbs that we leave behind, we are constructing, actively constructing our digital identity or representations of ourselves online. And we're making decisions about the ways that we represent ourselves in just the same way that we make decisions about the way that we represent ourselves in real world context, just the same way that we spend time figuring out how we'll do our hair for the day or what shoes or what outfit we'll wear. Um, in those same decisions, we're, you know, we're, we're making those decisions about how others will view us in a real world context or face to face. We need to make those decisions, and we currently make those decisions about the ways that we represent ourselves online and in digital contexts. And so on one level, we're thinking about our own behaviors and the ways in which when we participate online, what is that saying about us as we interact? But at the same time, when we think about uh, our students, how do those interactions uh, impact the digital identity or those different identities of our students? We have to have discussions and, and, and dialogue about, okay, how much uh, of a, you know, of a viewpoint should they have in those decisions and in the creation of the digital identity? Um, so this is another thing that we have to have discussions about and, and figure out, okay, what does this really mean? How is this impacting our identity or identities as learners, as in individuals, as scholars, as students? Um, you know, how is this impacting all of the different things that we do? So the real challenge that we have to think about is if we want our students to participate in a web environment, in digital text and tools, how do we do so so that they can effectively, authentically, safely, securely interact in a way that's not going to be negative for them in the future? So it's a lot of dialogue and thought about what are the instructional opportunities to make this happen without penalizing or hurting the kids that we're working with. If we look at the web literacy map, once again, they unpack it. This is version 1.1. They unpack it as exploring, building, connecting. In this video, in this module, we're looking at connecting or participating on the web. We're thinking about aspects such as sharing, collaborating, community parts participation, privacy, and also open practices. Open practices is very important for me. We'll continue to unpack it in other videos and other blog posts. But it's uh, you know it's about thinking and learning and teaching and sharing with others openly online. And what does that mean? What is the complexity that exists as we think about that word open? As we expand to the current version of the web literacy map, we can look at open. Uh, we can look at participation and see that open practice there. But then also, once again, we're seeing sharing. We're seeing contributing. So how do you reach out and add to the work of others? So it's a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of collaboration. We also see once again the protection side. We're thinking about security, privacy, encryption, um, and then also how we connect with others. So what are ways that we can connect with others online so that we're sensitive to the needs once uh, so that we're not uh, inflammatory or setting someone else um, as we reach out and connect with other people online. So once again, if we look at participation, we're looking at a group of local or global learners. So a group of local learners would be the children that are in your classroom. It might be people in your uh small group of learners that you see on a regular basis. A global learners might be people outside of your local group. So it might be people that you are acquaintances with online. It'd be people on Twitter, in your feed, or in your professional learning network or personal learning network. 
There could be pen pals that your 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 students interact with online. Um, you, know, you might have global affiliates that are in your Facebook feed. Um, so there's a multiple ways that we can look at this. And I think it's important that we take a look at this local and global intersection of the classroom. So when we think about learning the ways that technology can impact learning, a lot of times we say that technology has the, the ability to possibly like break down classroom walls. That's what we're really getting at here with this local and or global uh, intersection. So we look at a group, a group of local or global learners to arrive at a common outcome. Um, and what we're saying there is that people are working on the same sort of idea or same sort of project and unpacking that. And they come, they come across, you know, lessons learned that are common across the project. And the, the last piece of that that I really like is that we're looking at this outcome or achieving this outcome via multiple pathways of knowledge. And we'll talk about learning pathways in, in other posts and other videos. But one of the things to keep in mind here is that with multiple pathways of knowledge, you know, there's not one route that we all take to achieve, you know, that, that ending. There's not one route that we've all taken to get to where we are in our career. We have to acknowledge that people have multiple pathways to achieve uh, and be successful. And so there's multiple pathways that are out there for our learners to get to the end, get to the answer, to think about the final product, to, uh, you know, to consider their process along the way. So there's multiple pathways that we're trying to make sense of as we make all of this happen. So if we're thinking about participation online, if we're thinking about online collaborative inquiry, we have to start to think about what might this really look like. So there's a couple different tools that I currently use right, right now. I'll start at the bottom and move my way to the top. One of the tools I've used a lot in my own work is blogging. Uh, so I regularly blog on my website. I, uh, in the past, have had students blog. I help them develop their own uh, blogging spaces, their own tools. There's a lot of free tools that are out there. One of the tools that I've used a lot in the past is Blogger, uh, a tool that was purchased by Google. Very good tool, easy to use. Um, there's other tools out there that I use now with, with students. I've used uh, Wix and Weebly in higher ed, in uh, classrooms with uh, K-12 students. There is an opportunity to use free versions of WordPress. Uh, there are uh, Tumblr blogs. There's a lot of different tools. But what you're looking at is, is there a way to build up a digital identity or build up a, 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 a website or a web presence so that we can document learning over time? And the reason is that if we participate how can we build up those skills so that we know what to say, how to say it, what not to say, how to share, how to build up that digital identity and be safe? So a blog or a website is one potential tool. Also, I look at Google groups or discussion threads. I think it's uh, a powerful tool to, especially in hybrid learning context, to build in discussion forums so that our learners can sort of interact and intersect um, you know, with each other in an online space. So we can have discussion threads or discussion forums so that they can have a little bit of dialogue. It's okay if the dialogue or the discussion group is closed and it's just for the members of that learning group with the understanding of, okay, let's build up these behaviors and build up this thought process. So when you go out and you openly online discuss and share, in your own work or, you know, as part of this class or your own future, how do you do things so that it's appropriate and that you're not, uh, once again, you know, inflammatory or uh, hurtful to others out there? Another tool that I love and I've used it a lot in the past is Padlet. Previously, it was called Wallwisher. Uh, Padlet is a fun tool that you can have students collaborate and they can sort of brainstorm together and, and share their ideas out with one another. And then the last tool, and this pairs up with the, the, the first one that we talked about, Blogger, Wikispaces is a uh, website. It's a wiki that you can run on your own. Wikispaces works incredibly well for educators. I've used Wikispaces a lot in my classroom. And what I use it for is instead of having students email me a paper or email me a project and it basically lives on their hard drive and collects dust and then it comes to me and it collects dust. I'd much rather have my learners 
and I did this in, in K-12, and I've also done it in higher ed, I'd rather have my learners share their work process and, and product with others in the room, you know, and then also, if possible, share their work with others openly online. And the, one of the things that I've noticed as you change that paradigm, instead of a student sharing their work with just the instructor, but if they're sharing their work with others in the class, either in a closed group or sharing their work with others openly online, what happens is the level of authenticity and the level of audience changes in the work product. And strangely, I've had students in the past say, well, okay, when I was just giving the assignment or the, the product to you, the instructor or the classroom teacher, it was one thing. But now that I know that my peers in the classroom, not even other individuals openly online, but if I know that other people in the classroom can see this, now I take it a little bit more seriously. Now I think about audience in my work. And okay, who am I writing this for? Is this just a paper I'm writing for a class or is this a position paper on a larger issue? So I'm thinking more about audience and being, uh, you know, and my voice as a writer, but then also level of authenticity. So maybe I'll take this assignment a little bit more um, uh, seriously is the word that I'm looking for. So why is all this stuff important? One of the reasons why participation is important to me, one of the reasons why online collaborative inquiry is very important is that we're really drilling down into the root of synthesis in work. And synthesis is terribly challenging in our classrooms, terribly challenging in our own, in our own work. But synthesis, what we're really thinking about is sort of balancing out multiple outcomes uh, you know, thinking about cognitive dissonance and okay, you know, what is my thesis and, and what is my point of view? And then what are alternate points of view? What are ways that I can rationalize that? So one of the challenges or one of the opportunities here is that we can really drill down into synthesis as a tool as our learners try to make sense of it. So with online collaborative inquiry, through the use of digital text and tools, we might be able to say, okay, how can I sort of push pause on learning and document my learning process over time and share that learning process over time as others see it? So as an example, if I'm blogging, if I'm working on a project, if I'm documenting my thinking over time, if three or four times throughout the project, I'm sort of stopping and reflecting and writing and saying, hey, here's where I am right now. You're sort of presenting a point and you allow others to look at your thinking and push alternate points of view or you know some revisions to your thinking and help you over time and then continue to synthesize that out and make sense of it so through the digital through digital tools we have this opportunity i think this is also important participation online is important because we can help our students understand this local global dialectic and what i mean by that is many times in our classroom we get stuck in what's happening at the local level. We get stuck on what's happening on a personal level. We get stuck on what hap what's happening in our classroom, um, you know, in our little neighborhood. And many times we ignore what's happening outside of that uh, little nexus. We get, we get lost on, okay, well, what's happening? This is what's happening in my school, but what's happening in the school next door to me? What's happening in the neighborhood next to me? What's happening in, you know, communities that are not like mine? Um, and it's important you know, if we can help our students, you know, if we can, if we can help our students create this digital identity and participate online and act like members of a network society, we can say, okay, well, here's what's happening locally with me. Let me try and figure out and let me look globally and let me look at what's happening in your neck of the woods and figure out, okay, how are you dealing with these situations? So I think this, you know, participation online has an opportunity for us to unpack that local global dialectic. I think uh, one of the other reasons why this is important to me is if we look at the connected learning pieces uh, that are out there that I've shared in this module, one of the things that it helps us do is we sort of think about our problems and solutions to problems. So in a, in a connected classroom, we can look at, okay, here is my problem. Here's a situation that I currently have. All right, let me research online. Let me figure out what other people have done to deal with that situation. 
They'll let me bring it back to my own process or problem or situation. Let me evaluate, let me test it, and let me make it, you know, let me act upon that. Well, we can only do all of this if we're sharing online. So if, if we're, if, you know, bring it back to the classroom teacher, if you are blogging, if you're sharing and openly reflecting about your work, about your teaching, about your learning, about your lesson plans and or unit plans, if you're sharing your work openly online and you're documenting your thinking over line, then other people can take a look at your thinking. And they, as they are going along this learning process, they can take a look at your thinking and say, okay, well, I, I see what you did here and I like that and I like the way that you as an individual or as an educator you dealt with that problem or you dealt with that situation. And now I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to learn from you. Um, and so that's a, a powerful piece as we think about other people that are viewing our work online. And as you participate online, then they can see what you've done and they can learn vicariously from you. So how do we do this in our classroom? We've had a couple different models up to this point. Some of the models that I want to focus on, especially when I think, when I think about participation and online collaborative inquiry, right away I'm thinking about many times lesson planning. And I'm thinking about one day or one, you know, chunk of time in the day, maybe a couple days. But the other thing is when I think about participation and online collaborative inquiry, I think you have to really drill down and you don't want to achieve everything all at once. So I'm thinking about lesson plans for the most part when I'm thinking about participation. One of the first models that I look at is the SAMR model. Um, and so one of the things that I think about is we talk about the great things that technology can do when it's integrated into our classroom. Well, the SAMR model is basically suggesting or making us think about how can we transform? So yes, when we get started with technology, maybe we just enhance. So maybe you take a lesson that you currently do and it works and it works well. And you say, okay, how can I enhance this just a little through the use of technology? So I might substitute in a tool. So my students right now, they, uh, you know, they research the 50 states in my classroom. Each student looks at one of the 50 states and I want them to substitute a tool in. So instead of them going to the library and they you know what they normally would do is they pull books to the library or I pull up the encyclopedia from the back of the classroom. What I want to do this time is I want to substitute in the use of the internet. So I want my learners to be able to go online and research. And all I'm doing is just substituting in something else uh, into the classroom with no real changes that are occurring other than that. I also might have the opportunity to augment. So I might substitute in that tool, but now I'm really improving upon what's happening. So through the use of the internet as a search, I might really improve the learning in the classroom. The substitution I might give them, let's say you have your students that they're they're searching online, but you give them links, direct links to go to. But you might not really be changing much if you're just giving them a, you know the same resources that they would have from the library, but you might really augment what they're doing if you're really improving instruction that's there. But then the same model wants us to think about is, how do I get above that line? So how do I really take technology and, and push us beyond that line into modification and possibly re redefining what's happening in my classroom. And, and the way that we do that is we think about our own learners. We think about our content area. We think about our learners. We think about what do they do well and what are they not really that good at. And you think about the different tools that are out there. And I agree, there's tons of digital text and tools that are out there. There's new tools and apps pretty much every day that pop up. So you as the educator have to be the expert and you have to say, okay, well, what might work really well and really resonate with my, with my learners? And then at the same time, you have to test drive it in your classroom. So with the SAMR model, we're looking at, okay, how do I take what I'm doing and move from substitution to augmentation up into above that line? How do I modify and redefine? So how do I have my learners do something that might be inconceivable before? So if we think about our, our students learning about the 50 states and they each um, you know, go online and research the 50 states, previously they would write a paper about their state or they might do a presentation or a diorama. Well, what if they 
built, you know, a PSA or they they created a video about their state? What if they built a page on a website? What if as a class you created a wiki? What if you had your learners go in and edit and revise Wikipedia and look at the Wikipedia pages about their state and edit those pages? You can do all of this, but what you have to think about is, okay, what, what was previously inconceivable? Okay. Nothing is impossible. You have to figure out, okay, how can I really modify? How can I make learning meaningful? How do I get excited about what I could possibly do here and also get my, my learners excited about it? The other thing that I really think about when I consider the, the contenary knowledge, the pedagogical knowledge is the TPAC model. Um, and TPAC is, it can seem convoluted for different people. One of the reasons why TPAC is very important for me is TPAC affirms a lot of the expertise that learners, educators and learners already have. So if we think about the, the TPAC model, if we, if we start off, we start off with content knowledge. So I usually begin with content knowledge, that CK part of it. The content knowledge as an educator, you should already have that. Okay, so if you're going to teach seventh grade science, you should already have the content area knowledge and the expertise in science. Okay, if you don't, then there's an issue beyond this module and all the other classes. So you should be an expert in what you're teaching. Then there's the, the pedagogical knowledge. So the pedagogical knowledge is how do you teach that specific, uh, how, do you, how do you teach in general? We pull those together into PCK. We pull that into pedagogical content area knowledge. And that is, okay, so I, my content knowledge is seventh grade science. My pedagogical knowledge is how do I teach in general? So my pedagogical content area knowledge is how do I teach and teach effectively seventh grade science? So how to pull that together. And that's what we work on in our in our pre-service programs. That's what we work on in PD. Um, so that pedagogical content knowledge, that PCK, is very important. We spend a lot of time and a lot of years, and many of us, we constantly refine, and I know that I do, this over time. So I'm constantly building up my content knowledge, and I'm thinking about new pedagogies, and I'm thinking about those pedagogies, and how do those impact my content knowledge? So that's all pedagogical content knowledge on the bottom, that intersection of that Venn diagram. And we, many of us, we know that, and we're constantly proving that. So the next thing is that the bottom two circles in that triad, those are really reaffirming all of the things that we really know. So when we think about technology integration, sometimes we think, we, we think that it's impossible, that we can't know everything. Well, with TPAC, what we're doing is we're pulling in that third lens on the top. All right, that third lens is the technological knowledge. And that's saying, okay, you know your content knowledge, you know your CK, you know your pedagogical knowledge, you know your PK. Well, what happens when we pull in that lens of technology into that? Okay, so as an example for TPK, the technological pedagogical knowledge, how does pedagogy change with technology? It does. I mean, that's what most of my, my classes all focus on we take a look at technological content knowledge to the TCK. So how is your content area knowledge of seventh grade science or foreign language or phys ed? How is that changing because of technology integration? It might be, okay, you have to think about that. The sweet spot that we're looking for, and I try to work for, I push for in my own work and I guide others is that middle nexus where all three lenses come together. And that's where your pedagogical knowledge, your content area knowledge, and the technological knowledge all come in together. And you say, okay, this is the sweet spot that I'm going for. This is perfect integrate, perfect integration of content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, and technology all together so that I'm achieving what I want to achieve and my students are learning at the same time. So the reason why I love TPAC is that it really reaffirms what we know about content area knowledge and about pedagogy, about teaching and learning, and then saying, okay, you already know two thirds of the puzzle here. So if you feel like you don't know anything about technology, you're coming into a lot of this with two thirds of the battle already conquered. And now you have to think about, okay, how do I really integrate technology into that? Very powerful.
Another thing that we look at are the ISTE standards, and I, th I see these being uh, complementary to the web literacy work that we've been doing. Uh, ISTE just released the uh, standards for students. And what they look at is digital citizen, knowledge constructor, innovative designer, computational thinker, creative communicator, global collaborator, empowered learner. You can drill down into these in some of the resources that we've shared out there. But really what we're looking at is there's different elements of this that tie nicely into that idea of being a participatory member of the internet. Okay, so we see little pieces of that in being a digital citizen in being a knowledge constructor and a creative communicator. So these are looking at some of the skills and the dispositions needed by our learners. Some of your schools and some of your environments want us to tie into the ISTE standards. For me and my work, it's a little easier to look at just participating online or online collaborative inquiry. And then I know that some of these elements are folding into it. Another thing that we look at is the ISTE standards for educators that were just released. Um, and so ISTE standards for educators are looking at this uh, in a little different of a lens. The ISTE standards for educators are looking at the skill sets and the abilities and aptitudes that teachers, that educators need to have as they use technology in their work process and in their work product. So professionally, we might need to be a learner, a leader, a citizen. We need to be able to collaborate with others, design, uh, in real world and digital context, we need to be able to facilitate and then also analyze or be an analyst. So this is more along the professional lines of being an educator. Those of you that are uh, teachers or are viewing this from an educational context, this is what SDE is looking at and many of your uh, professional contexts are gonna wanna see that you can act within these capacities. Once again, I bring it back to the web literacy map, I think it's a lot easier to make sense of uh, this module right now, we're looking at participation. Participation, I've also framed as online collaborative inquiry, and you can drill back to the specific definition about co constructing information, you know, in, in local and global context. And we're folding in elements to that. So we're looking at sharing and contributing, working openly, and protecting others while we connect. Once again, that's module two in our web literacy work. We took a deep dive into what it means to participate online in digital context. And we're taking a look at what it really means to have online collaborative inquiry and how do we make that happen in our own work and in those of the individuals we work with.